Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of From the Bottom Up. It's going to be a little different today. We're going to uh, go at a number of different clips that I've collected since yesterday, range from politics, judges, um, countries that are happier, why, and then um, also into a clip I've never seen before that Andy didn't get to show on his show, but um, I've got, again, my special guest, David Hoffmeister with me. Welcome, David. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and some of you may know, um, if you're in Mexico or if you've been following along our community, today is Election Day in Mexico. And in America, that comes across every four years or every two years. They have midterm elections. But today in Mexico, this is the largest Election Day that I've heard they've ever had. Um, why that is, maybe we'll go into that in the show, but to start us out, I'd like to play a 10-minute comedy clip on these elections. Some of the con contestants, that's not the right word. Contenders. <laughs> Contenders. <laughs> Candidates. Candidates. And, uh, and just kind of go into that a little bit, and then we'll, we'll come back to our show. So enjoy this. John Oliver will bring us all up to date on on the candidates and what's going on with today's election. Yeah, he's a British comedian on HBO, so he's, he's based in America, but he's British. So. But he does use the facts. He's not, you know, he's just not making up ideas, yeah. except when it protects him, yeah, exactly. <laughs> which is very funny. You'll see that. <laughs> yeah. Now okay. we're talking <laughs> <laughs> current events. <laughs> we covered a lot in that one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I'd, I'd say, um, yeah, that, that what we need to remember as we start to begin to, to go from the bottom up with all of that, because that is, um, as far as current events goes, this, he presented things quite humorously, but quite extremely. That, things that people aren't even conscious of and brought it up into awareness. But what was coming to me, and I, we talked about this a little, a little before we went on the air, was, um, was a line from uh, What the Bleep Do We Know? You know, we believe the world that has been presented to us. When you're watching things and you have emotions coming up about 120 politicians being murdered uh, in this particular, leading up to this particular election. We're not saying tortured, we're not saying threatened or receiving death threats because that's going on right now in the United States. Maxine Waters, Maxine Waters is, is receiving death threats for some of the things that she said at a public rally. We're saying 120 have been murdered leading up to this and basically we have to go much deeper to start to say that everything that we perceive through the five senses was invented by the ego. So, you know, we're talking about a massive state of denial that everything that's perceived in this world is part of the deception. The five senses are part of it. The ego invented the five sen senses. Uh, God didn't create them. And so that's, that's where we want to bring it back to. We want to go from the bottom up and look at some of these issues and then look at how can we go deeper from the bottom up and come to that real world or that happy dream or that forgiven state of mind and, and take some of these issues. So this is quite political. You've started off with the political clip and then we can, uh, we can take it from there. Well, one of the things I heard you say when, I don't know if the audience heard it, when we were watching that clip was when Pinya Nieto, I don't know if that's the way you say his name, but he was so attractive and that's what brought him in and you could just feel he's got a soap opera star wife and all the love everybody felt for him and then I think the big thing that, they didn't show it in the video, but the big thing that triggered in Mexico was these 43 students that got murdered and somehow the government's associated and all this stuff, I don't really know, but but then his popularity, and that, that's being used as the reason to hate him now. And now he's got a 12% approval rating. Then John Oliver said, but, but we can overlook all of that, or almost, 
because he's so attractive. So maybe there's something to go into yeah. Yeah. with that idea. I think it's, uh, for those of you that have been watching all day, you know, that uh, Andy and Nicholas started off with, I mean, basically uh, talking about their disillusionment. Um, <coughs> and uh, Nicholas was talking about how disillusioned he was in university and yet he, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? You know, his family saying, what are you going to do? Are you going to go to university? But he, he didn't really have a reason for it. And then <laughs> Andy, <coughs> that was Nicholas, Andy talked about build, putting all this energy to wealth building and to have more choice and to be able to be free. And uh, I would say that all the way through the shows, we touched on them and then Netta, you know, was bringing up this whole thing of past life and and this pain and, and actually uh, bringing it up and saying it live on air that there's, it's, it was daunting to get in touch with this attraction to pain. But that's the trick of this whole world. The ego invented the pleasure and the pain. And the thing that never is brought into awareness, the ego doesn't want it brought up from the unconscious mind but the Holy Spirit is bringing it up, is that it's impossible to seek for pleasure without finding pain. And we were seeing it right there in that clip where here's some, a president with a 12% approval rating. Trump's uh, <laughs> approval rating is hugely bigger than that, 12%. And, and they were saying, had a child out of wedlock and uh, had two, two affairs and uh, that his one wife, what she die of, of epilepsy. epilepsy, and none of that seemed to matter in him getting elected because he's married to a beautiful soap opera queen. The attraction, the handsomeness, the attraction of the couple far overshadowed. He went in, he was swept into an election as the president of Mexico. And that's the thing that you find about this world, is it's all based on appearances. It's all based on a fantasy. And there are so many fantasies of pleasure that are seen as acceptable and that people can just pursue after. And then they wonder why the pain is there, not seeing that pleasure and pain are the same. And that's what the Course is teaching. That's one of those things that the Course, a lot of Course teachers don't even want to touch that one with a 10-foot pole, but that's what those three sections in the Course are about attraction to guilt, attraction to pain, attraction to death. There's a death-worshipping mechanism in the mind and it's called the ego. The ego is, is a death wish, it's a death worshipper. And as long as you believe in it, then when you seek for one, you get the other, you get the opposite. So this is a world of projected opposites that the ego has come up with. And in order to really wake up, you have to start to see the things that seem in this world to be very different. Like a handsome president with a soap opera queen wife and then all the corruption and everything, that these are actually the same. And that as long as you believe in the ego, you will be attracted to some illusions and, and have an aversion to others, not seeing that they are actually the same. That's why there's a workbook lesson in Course in Miracles 128, which is basically saying, the world I see holds nothing that I want. That's more along the lines of what our Diana is going around teaching over in Europe. She was teaching, give up the desirable. Is that a popular topic? Are you going to get 500 people at a conference to come and give up the desirable? Are you going to hear popular speakers, law of attraction, and all of the, a lot of Course in Miracles teachers talking about the attraction to pain, the attraction to death, the attraction to guilt. No, but that extreme example with the politics was that, that you could see the anger, which the way the whole piece started, where they were just furious and raging at this, this current president screaming into the camera children, everyone screaming in, and he's not even running. He's, he's not even running. <laughs> They've got these other candidates. So I think the thing is, is when you start to look at things like pain, who in their right mind would be attracted to pain? Who in their right mind would be attracted to death? Who in their right mind would be attracted to guilt? 
no one in their right mind, but, but the ego is the belief that pain and pleasure, it says are different, Jesus says, but to itself, it smiles without letting you know and says, it is death. It's funny because I think one of the ways that, because they're equal, right? Meaning they mostly must both be present as much as the other. Yes. The, the attractive things and the, the repulsive things. But Not in awareness, but that's the key. That's the unconscious yeah. mind. That's where we have to get into the unconscious mind. Well, I was even thinking, even the way it plays out in the world, because in my life or in my world, I'd see more of the things that I'm attracted to than the things that I'm repulsed by. And even America, it's like the American dream. And you can have, no one talks about all of like the poor poverty and the, the more poor than tons of other countries. They're just thinking about this attraction. The attraction to wealth and, and success is defined by the ego, but nobody talks about slave labor. Yeah. You know, those are the things that, that are just kind of pushed underneath. But this is the way the mind works, that the mind doesn't want that idea that it's impossible to seek for pleasure without finding pain. The ego doesn't want that one coming out. You don't hear that in law of attraction. You don't read the popular books and the popular things that are out there aren't going to talk about that belief which has to be raised into awareness because I think the thing about it is is that this world is a is a distracted device it's a veil drawn over the truth and whatever you're attracted to about this world if whatever you're attracted to about any images of this world you also are attracted means you're going to take the the pain you're going to take the heartbreak the tragedy the horror you 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 can't get one, have one without the other. Now, is that just because of the identity or that you literally are attracting pain like in a form way as well? Or is it as long as you believe in the ego, you send out messengers to the world and then you receive, the five senses just receive these, these messengers. Mm. But Jesus goes into great, almost goring detail about how as long as you're sending fear's messengers out, you get them back. Pain is definitely one of fear's messengers. So is pleasure. But the thing about it is, until you free your mind and let go of the ego belief system, you're just going to keep drawing forth both sets of messengers and then feeling so mysterious. Like, why is it that I can't just have the pleasure yeah. without the pain? Yeah. But see, that's not the way it works. I mean, there's an old song about love and marriage. Love and marriage goes... You could, I'll re-sing it. <laughs> pain and pleasure, pain and pleasure. Go together like a horse and carriage. This, my friend, is the way it is. You can't have one without the other. You know, that's what this is really about. And we can talk about, we'll go into it with politics. You can go into wealth, pursuing wealth and, and thinking that poverty is material poverty. But Jesus never taught about material wealth and material poverty, you know, he said, blessed are the poor, for, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor. I don't hear a lot of evangelical people out there now talking about blessed are the poor. This politician was talking about that, but they said his, his policies waver and waver. The thing about it is, ego thinking is poverty. Yeah. And right-minded thinking yeah. or Holy Spirit thinking, that is wealth. And it has absolutely nothing to do with material. You know, I mean, I've seen uh, gurus in India that are so devoted and they go through their whole life and they're just sitting out there with the flies and then they go more and more into samadhi experiences where they're not eating and they're just there. And then the, at the end of their life, the devotees are all gathered around in some hot, stinky, playing with flies all around, and then suddenly their body goes very still as they just merge into samadhi. That's not going to make the cover of Time magazine as one of the most important experiences, because even Ramana Maharshi, you know, you could see, seemed to have his body very thin, and Ramana, you know, there seemed to be a tumor and all this from the world perspective, but these glowing eyes, if you ever see those photographs, Ramana's eyes are glowing and it looks like he's just a skeleton with some skin stuck on it and he's like saying the words, why are you crying to the disciples? 
where could I go? You know, he's in a state of oneness and he doesn't understand the tears of the disciples because he's in such a state of, of bliss. That's abundance. Abundance has nothing to do with money. It has nothing to do with materiality. And those who pursue, like Andy was talking about today, who pursue that goal, the Holy Spirit keeps intercepting. And the only time, I love that, where the only time where he got the deal, he was always going to get the big deal. He, he did everything right. He had all the skills. The big deal never, never, never happened. Even his 24-year-old guru says, it's about linking up with God. It's not about making money. This is the, the wealth guru, is Holy Spirit speaking through there. And then finally, the only deal that Andy ever got was, so he had enough money to come out to a silent retreat <laughs> and, and have just a little bit extra. And that's, all, that's the big deal. That's what you, some of you were on the show, you saw that that was it. So this is radical stuff, but this is all about what the mystics and saints have been talking about for centuries. Don't think you can have material abundance, because what do those e words even mean together? Material abundance. What did Mary Baker Eddy say? You know, there's no mind in matter, there's no life, truth, substance, intelligence in matter. And so, it's not really mysterious, it's like the ego has to be unveiled. And that's, politics is a good one, because you can see that the candidates, you know, that's seemingly ahead, that's way ahead and it looks like he's going to win today, he's talking about helping the poor. But everything about this world has to be questioned, including who are the poor? Who are the poor? That's what struck me most of what you're saying, because I just, I felt like the pain, once you take it off the world, it's, because we face that here a lot in the community where just like, whoa, all this darkness comes up and where did that come from? You know, we thought we were doing really well before we came into the community. And then, yeah, yeah. But I just had this really deep feeling like that's so okay. I mean, I say the words, but like it's necessary so that you don't put it out there and you keep facing it and it makes me think that countries like India or people that aren't pursuing that or don't have the so-called wealth are actually just more advanced in a way because it's not in their consciousness, this yeah. whole attraction thing. Jesus says in the Course, you can't judge your advances from your retreats. So when we look at countries like India, for example, and people look at, you know, living in the shanty towns and all this and go, oh gosh, they need some help. But then we have all these great mystics and saints that emanate these transcendent non-dual teachings and all the great ones that have come out of India, just amazing, that go way beyond the, the egoic definitions of, of success and failure. They go to transcendent peace of mind. They're so glorious and they have nothing to do with that. And then while we're on it, you know, we can, you know, before we did this show, Jason was doing, like, like Netta was doing, he bas basically, we talked this week about how you're dealing You've been dealing with pain, and Netta brought up about the past lives and, and the past memories, but it's, it's still a, an issue, particularly today. She was saying, I, I can't talk about the CD because there's something more important I need to talk about, but maybe we can, we've got our clips, but maybe you can share a bit, because you've, you've been dealing with pain and it had to do with a seemingly, uh, on the surface of things, of a vasectomy operation that didn't seem to go well or that you've had a lot of pain and how that's, you know, infected your relationships and, you know, that's the same thing that Netta was doing, like talking about that, that's something that's really you're facing mm -hmm. and thinking about on a daily basis. Maybe we can use these same teachings to go into that a bit because you're going for surgery, is it next week? Friday. Friday. Yeah, on the sickness online retreat, I talked a bit about the circumstances with the vasectomy and how I attribute the pain that I have now towards that and I've spent a lot of time down here in Mexico going to different, well not different, I have one urologist and he's been, <laughs> I don't know what to go into that, but he's been a lot of fun because, yeah, at first I thought, well, okay, I'm in Mexico, it's going to be a lot cheaper, but they really won't be as good a quality doctors as, as up in America, but I went and visited this guy and he would constantly answer the phone when I'm in there and it was really funny stuff but I had some good healing with him and then 
just last week, I went to see him for something else. And all I can say is all these witnesses kept coming up to me from America and Canada saying how much actually the medical care down here is better than in Canada and America. And I was, I got so happy, but I was actually shocked at the same time. One of time. your beliefs was... Psh. It was pop. I was like, <laughs> tell me. So they just kept telling me how. And I actually got convinced that the medicine down here is better. And why is the medicine better? The number one reason is, is they put so much care and attention into you. They're not rushing and sticking you in this medical model and a number. And so they actually feel, and since everything is about a relationship, that's how, that's my interpretation of all, but, but actually in form too, they use the same, the same care. But the purpose that I wanted to do the show originally this Sunday was to help me prepare for this Friday. And I don't actually know where to go with it, but I do feel, yeah, a lot of emotion with it because I want, I want to get to the root. I'm even open to stopping the surgery if I was convinced that I shouldn't. I can still feel this strong attraction like this is going to be the solution. And there were some quotes I wanted to read from the Course around if, if you are afraid, if the mind is afraid of healing, you should not attempt miracles. And you should temporarily rely on magic, pi magic or pills mm -hmm. yeah. because of the fear of healing in the mind. And the question that arose for me quite strongly was, well, am I afraid of healing then, true healing, which is forgiveness? Because I seem to have so many miracles of that. Or is he talking about afraid of healing of the body? Well, she can't be talking about that. No. So if I'm afraid of healing, why am I even going there? It still comes up as this, why am I even going there? Why don't I just go for the solution? Or can I be... <laughs> can I be convinced on this show that it's okay to do the surgery or convinced otherwise? Because I don't want to go into this thing with a split mind and it is split, yeah. so... Well, it's beautiful because this is beautiful that you're willing to go into this because this is for the whole universe. And what it is, is I would say, uh, we were talking about Netta's album is titled The Light Has Come. And then as soon as these songs came to, to Netta and then all this darkness come, almost like it was a giant flusher, like all of a sudden these come through and not able to sing certain ones. But let's just say right away for the record that there is a tremendous fear of healing tremendous fear of healing. There's a tremendous fear of the light and that the entire cosmos of time and space was pro pro projected and made as a, as a defense against the light and that all of it was made as a giant veil to cover over the darkness of separation from God which is immense, the belief in separation from God. The belief you could leave your Creator is, is a pain worse than any pain imaginable in, in sense of a physical pain, the belief that you could actually leave a loving creator and go off and make up an identity apart from that creator is the worst. And that's that tiny mad idea, the fall from grace, that blip. But once we start to, we have to acknowledge first of all that there's a tremendous fear of the light and there's a tremendous fear of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit was given as an answer to the belief in separation. And the mind was so terrified of what it seemed to be a fall from grace, from being in perfection and perfect love and oneness, that it seemed, when it seemed to go through a fall, it went into terror. And the answer was given immediately. The Holy Spirit was given as an it, The whole thing was answered in one instant, but the mind that fell, that believed in the lie, it's tremendously afraid of the Holy Spirit. So that's why Jesus will say that very few can hear the voice for God directly because of the fear and the resistance to the light and the fear of the Holy Spirit. So let's talk a little bit about magic. Magic is, is giving uh, powers of the mind, which is where all power is. Power is only of the mind. There is no mind and matter and there's no power in the world. Nothing is powerful in the world. It's just a projection. But mind was given, there's healing beliefs that were given to certain things in form, and that's what we could call it surgery, we could call it medicine, 
you could call it alternative medicine, massage, um, um, moving energies around the body, balancing energies, all those things are all, all in the realm of magic. And there's nothing wrong with magic in the sense that when the mind is so afraid of healing in the mind, which is waking up and knowing who you really are as the Christ, that's terrifying, then healing belief is given to what seem to be external agents. So this doctor that you've been working with up in California, nice rapport, and he's saying, I think the surgery, the reversal surgery could be helpful. It, it, I can't guarantee it, but it may, which is very much like doctors saying this, I can't guarantee it, but it may help you. There's, there's nothing wrong with giving healing belief temporarily to external agents when you're too afraid of true healing in the mind. So basically Jesus says that if, for example, if the miracle came and the mind wasn't really ready for it, it could induce even a suicide. It, it could even induce someone to, to try to kill themselves, kill the body. If, if too much light, if too much of the miracle was introduced and... Do you mean a miracle that would like heal the pain down It would there? heal the identity confusion right. in okay. the mind. It would do more than yeah. heal the pain, it would do, heal the identity confusion of believing you're a person in time and space instead of the Christ. But you see the gulf between yeah. the Christ and then being a human being. So magic is, there's nothing wrong with it, but it's just that the reason that people, the reason Gandhi put faith in herbs, the reason you put faith in going to see a urologist in Mexico or going to see a surgeon, is because healing belief has been given to these seemingly external agents that are apart from the mind, but really they aren't. You know, they're still just thoughts in mind. It's because there's too great a fear of, of actual healing. Because actual healing would show that everything that you perceive is not real. So what have I had until this point then, where I've, I get happier with things, or like, oh, like the belief that Mexican medicine is worse, like in those pot, isn't that healing? Like, well, it's the, those are just symbols, like, like for example, you go out, they can, all these things can happen in Mexico and it doesn't seem to have such a high cost, and those are all just symbols of almost like the Spirit saying, keep coming, keep coming with me, keep following my guidance, because that's something that, that Netta and Emily talked about was guidance. That guidance is the way back to overcome the resistance to the light. Guidance is a way to say, where spirits like saying, I know you're terrified, but if you can just follow me step by step, I'll unwind you very, very carefully, and I'll build your confidence in the spirit. I'll build your confidence in the guidance. I'll build your confidence in how the spirit is taking you way beyond the belief that you're a person in a world, but that you're, you are truly a divine mind that, that lives, you're an idea in the mind of God. That's who you really are, but it's going to take a lot of unwinding to get there. So the real question, and I think Nicholas brought this up at the beginning, Nicholas brought the little book out, Purpose is the Only Choice, that in, really in any situation, whether it's a presidential election that seems to be happening in Mexico, which candidate do I vote for, whether it's do I get this surgery done, or is there an alternative method, or is there something you want me to see, is there some kind of fear? that's so deep that I'm at a belief that I'm holding on to that I could release. If there's something you want to show me, Holy Spirit, then please show it to me. I want to really see it. That's the prayer of the heart. And it's not really about the election or the World Cup's going on here. We have a giant cup behind us they put as a prop. We're, we're trying to keep it to current events. There's a big election in Mexico today and there's a big trophy. Uh, Jason, that's actually not the actual World Cup trophy. But, in this studio, we've got a big gold trophy and Soren got it placed in just the right place so we can use it as a prop today. Jesus likes that, for the props in here. But basically, anything that's symbols in the world that helps you feel like I'm, I'm progressing, I'm opening towards God, I'm, I'm healing, I'm moving in the direction of healing, that's helpful. And anything where you place so much faith in something that's an external is, is what they called an idol. That's what was brought up on the earlier shows. That's an idol made to take the place of God. 
So when we pursue things, whether it's um, solving problems in the world, whether it's trying to find the perfect house, the perfect career, the perfect partner, the perfect pet, the perfect amount of money in a bank account or whatever, all those are just idols because you're literally putting faith in, I will be happy when I get that thing. That's clearly an idol. And when you go for healing, it's a loosening from the belief in idols. And you're just saying, okay, I'm afraid, but just use the symbols to reach me, somehow reach me in a way that can be helpful, in a way that I feel like I'm coming back home, I'm coming back to you, God. Can the, um, can the surgery, rather than it being a symbol of fear of healing, be actually part of the plan to go deeper? Yeah, I've had, I remember many, many years ago, probably over 20 years ago, I went, I went to a Course in Miracles group and I was sitting in the group, it was a large group, and the facilitator was like saying, oh David, I'm so glad you're here, we've got a, we'd love to hear from you and we, you know, I really want to turn the group over to you and everything. And I'm in this course group and I kept hearing from the Holy Spirit, wait. And I'm like, okay, because they're all in the room, the facilitator's saying, take it away, and the Holy Spirit kept saying, wait. And I'm saying, thank you everybody, I'm, I'm glad to be here, I'm going to talk, talk to you about a few things, but the Spirit's like, wait, 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 and I didn't know what the waiting was for. I'm ready to, to go, and it's like, wait, wait, wait. Then the door opens, and a woman comes in, and she's got tears in her eyes, and this course study group was all about what was going to happen next with the woman who came in. I was like, wait, wait. And she had just gone, come from the doctor and she'd just been diagnosed with a terminal illness. She's coming to her course group, she's got tears in her eyes and she walks in the door and she, I could feel the whole energy shift and Jesus is like, yeah, this is what it's for. This is what the whole meeting's for. That's what the wait, wait, wait was for. And then she spoke up and she said, I'm a course student, I've been reading the book and it's telling me all the problems are in my mind and all the problems are my thoughts and beliefs and I've just come from the doctor and he's told me I've, I've got so long to live and I've got a terminal illness. I can't go home. I've been preaching to my kids, my husband. There is no such thing as external sickness, it's all in the mind. And I've just been diagnosed you know, with a terminal illness. I can't even go home. I, I feel too ashamed to walk into my family's house because I feel like I'm such a terrible Course in Miracles student and everything. And she said, so the doctor said, well, here's, here's what the doctor said. I'm going to have to go through treatments and I need to go into the hospital, I need to schedule a time in the hospital for some surgery, and, and she just, everybody just sat in silence as this woman came into this course group and poured it all out. Here's what's going on for me, she said. And then, after she, for 10, 15 minutes, poured it all out, and everybody was completely quiet, she looked over at me and she said, aren't I just giving in to the ego to go in for this surgery? that this doctor told me about, it goes against all the teachings and I've been talking about this stuff for years and I feel like a fool and I feel embarrassed to even face my husband and my children and I said, yes you are to go for that hospital appointment but you can't think of it as going in for treatment or surgery for a, an external illness because there is no external illness, you know, the mind was sick, Jesus says, that thought the body could be sick. That's his line in the Course. The mind was sick that thought the body could be sick. It's all mental. But I said, but when you go in there, you are a light worker. You are the Holy Spirit's agent. You are to go into that hospital and you are to bless all the doctors, How all the nurses, possible? you are, Jesus is just using this situation of what you believe it is just to go in there and shine the light. And I said, you can't think of it as you going in there as, as a victim, as somebody who's done something wrong, as somebody who doesn't get it, because how are you going to be the joy of the world? How are you going to be the light of the world if you believe that? So you go into that hospital and you keep that appointment and you 
You shine your light and you don't forget the reason that you're there. Don't forget the purpose that you're there because Spirit is counting on you to be used, to allow your body to be used, to be spoken through, to be smiled through. Your holy encounters with the receptionist, with everybody at that hospital, is part of the, the script and you're going to use it for that purpose. You can't hold on to this idea somehow that you've done something wrong. Spirit never looks at us as, as if we've done something wrong. Spirit never says, oh that's you know, you've done wrong, you've done... Spirit's like that GPS that even when you make turns and you're way off, it just says, make the next legal U-turn. <laughs> it doesn't go, you dummy! I just told you to turn left and you missed it. it the, the GPS never, never condemns, never criticizes, it always just goes, make the next turn or turn right. It will always bring you back on track to get to your destination. And the Holy Spirit always brings us back, never criticizes, never judges. So this is a great topic that you're bringing up because there's nothing wrong with magic. The only reason the mind would, would continue to believe in magic is because of the belief that it works. Why did Gandhi use herbs for healing for decades? Because it seemed to work. Why do people go to doctors and have surgeries for things like broken, broken legs or heart surgeries or whatever? It's because, what? It seems to work. They seem to come away from the doctor or from the, the nutrition center or from the, maybe they had some body energy balancing or something. It's all magical but it, it seems to work. And then there will come a point in everybody's journey back to God where the things that seem to work on, in linear time, some, they start to not work anymore. That's when people really start to pay attention to their thoughts even closer. That's when they go, they look at their mind even deeper and closer when the same things that worked over and over and over, magically, they don't seem to be working. And that just means that the Spirit's like saying, okay, we're ready for the next step to go into a higher level of, of consciousness and awareness. So even when those things fall apart, you're not failing. It's just that you're ready to, to start to tune into a higher level of, of consciousness, a higher frequency. So you see it's all positive. There's nothing ever going wrong. It's all just how ready am I to go and, and take complete responsibility for my state of mind. Like Netta was sharing that example of that past life where you went back and you could feel the shame of that that girl and thinking that, that she had done something wrong, that she was responsible for that scenario, that, that abuse or that rape or whatever. And again, the Course is teaching you're not responsible for the error, you're only responsible for accepting the correction. But also it teaches you can't accept the correction until you bring it all the way back into your mind. There, that's the Holy Spirit saying, come back, bring it to me, hand it over to me, I will take it away. There's tremendous resistance, it's almost like saying, no, I feel too shameful, I've done something terribly wrong and it was my fault. But it's never our fault, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, there is no sin, it's just, sin is a mistake to be correction, it's just an opportunity to choose again. It's not some kind of black mark on your soul, but the ego believes in punishment, the ego believes in personal responsibility, the ego believes something terribly was done wrong and that it can't be corrected. And the Holy Spirit doesn't even see sin. All he sees is, is opportunities for accepting the correction. It's that positive. I can see when you're talking like, the problem isn't even so much the idea of the surgery, it's letting my mind move in the direction that this isn't wrong. Like, it somehow is a, mar a, sh a stamp on, after all these years, I'm doing something wrong, but I'm like, yeah, I'm like, I don't know, I'm, so, I'm actually, I even, I'm so confused even about healing now, everything, I'm like, and I'm so scared that this, of this surgery still, like, even as I think of it, like, what they're going to do for four hours, and so the idea of being a miracle worker, when I'm kind of like, I need them to get it right, or I'm going to be screwed. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I can't. 
I can see why we're talking about this. You need like a turnaround, like Byron Katie would say, we got to turn it around. Because if you're going in there, I'm at your mercy. Oh, I, this is delicate down here, and be careful what, with your knives and whatever, you know. And my wife, you know, she's depending on this to go well. You know, like, I don't want to put any pressure on you, doctor, but this is like important. You know, the thing about it is, it's like we have to turn it around. We have to start to realize that everything, even doctors and nurses, are just agents that the Holy Spirit can use. But they're only going to reflect back to us where our state of mind is. That's why I love the stories of like Bernie Siegel and Larry Dossi. And I used to read, I mean, I was into near-death experiences and I'm reading about surgeons who start to realize the power of the mind. That's exciting. Like Bernie Siegel, he's like, He's like an ace surgeon. That's his life, you know. He's married. He's an ace surgeon. He's everything like this, and he starts to realize that his life's calling isn't to be a surgeon. That his life's calling's the, the miracle. He, so he starts to have all these miraculous experiences, even with people who have passed away in the hospital, and all kinds of witnesses to miracles. And then he gets so excited that he's more than a surgeon that he writes a book. And it was a book that I read many, many years ago, Love, Medicine, and Miracles. So here's a surgeon who writes Love, Medicine, and Miracles. Do you think he was popular? They used to put negative things, other doctors and surgeons, about him on the bulletin boards at his own hospital. Because, oh, one of our surgeons is into prayer now, and he's into miracles, with derogatory things. But he ended up, he and his wife, ended up, she's just gone, I think maybe even just recently passed away, but, but he, he continued on. They went around, Bobby and Bernie, speaking about miracles, speaking about there's a greater purpose in life, being used by the Holy Spirit to teach beyond the medical model, to teach the miracle. Here's a surgeon turned miracle worker. And when you're going there, you're not going there as a man to be helped by these external agents. You're going there with a purpose to extend, and then they're just going to reflect your purpose. The purpose is the only choice. The purpose you hold out in front is going to be reflected. And I think all of us know that. Even our people that are part of our community, just, you know, this, was it yesterday, the day before, there was, they were, uh, got off a bus in the middle, in the early morning hours and were grabbed and, and people came at them with knives and, and cut the purse off and, uh, you know, these are people that took their computer, took their computer and, and so on and so forth. But again, it comes down, I remember having the discussion a while back about this trip uh, and how they were going to do it and, and oh, I'm uncomfortable with taking a bus at night and so on and so I mean, I, I was in the conversations before that preceded the whole thing, but we're here to choose the miracle to join in purpose with the Holy Spirit, to follow <coughs> the guidance, and to let the Holy Spirit convince us that there's nothing to fear. That's Lesson 48. There is nothing to fear. We need to be convinced because of this huge fear of healing and a huge fear of the light. So this whole surgery opportunity that's coming up on Friday, Saturday, you know, this is, is you, but having to walk in to this with your purpose. And just let it go. Just like Netta was saying yesterday before the concert, she wasn't feeling up to really like doing a, a full concert, but she was tired, she'd rather watch, take a nap, watch a movie, and then she just, the purpose was the torch out in front and made it into an amazing extension of love and light. But it's the same with you going into the surgery. You have to go up there with, okay, Holy Spirit, it's your show. You use it for the glory of God, not going up there with these beliefs like, like this is a long-standing problem and that I need these surgeons to take it away. Because it's the purpose in our mind, holding that purpose with the Holy Spirit, that's what's going to shine away the darkness and the guilt. So any energy of even thinking of whether I should do it or not is probably a distraction from being ready to be the light worker. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, this do it or not thing, I remember there was a great being, great, great being named Krishnamurti. 
And Krishnamurti would have people follow him all over the world because he was such an amazing <laughs> being of love and light. But I do remember that there was a group of people and they thought, we're going to pin, we've got Krishnamurti here and we're going to pin him down on something that's been really eating at us for a long <coughs> time. So they tried to, to pin Krishnamurti down into the topic of sexuality like corner him, and they tried to get him to make a pronounced statement whether sexuality, having sex, was good and spiritual or bad and evil. <laughs> they tried to corner him and pin him down, and, and he takes things so deep into truth, into awakening, into that's the whole purpose of everything, is to know thyself, is to know who you are. And they're trying to pin him down into have sex or don't have sex. Like, give me an answer. And then Krishnamurti said the famous line, he, he looked at him and he said, have sex, don't have sex, but get on with it. And what did he mean by that? Everyone was like, whoa, he has spoken, have sex, don't have sex, but get on with it. It was like he was saying, don't make a distraction of these worldly decisions as if your whole life depends on it. It's in the mind, it's in consciousness, you know. They would scream at him. Sometimes they would be bitter and they would call him names and everything like this. And I would love watching those videos because it's like these people screaming at Krishnamurti. And then the camera goes over to Krishnamurti and he's got these twinkly, sparkly little eyes, innocent eyes. And he'd say, please, please, madams, gentlemen, let's get back to the real issue. After they were yelling at him, I was like, wow. Look how defenseless, look how childlike he is, because he was rooted in presence, in divine presence, and he wasn't going to get distracted with these kind of life or death decisions as if, you know, it's, it's kind of what Kristen was saying, you know, it's like I had the same movie came to mind when I, when that thing about, um, we don't have to think like this anymore. That's the same idea I had in the same movie when, this morning, because when you try to, whether it's a political discussion, or it's a thing whether to have surgery or not, or all these kind of things in form, really the Spirit's just saying, we don't have to think like that anymore. Every decision is a decision of purpose, and every decision is either a right-minded decision or a wrong-minded decision. What, remember that quote when you were on with, what, with uh, Susan? It was about everything brings you everything or nothing. And how do we reconcile that? Right-mindedness, listening to the Holy Spirit, brings you everything. That's where your abundance, your joy, your happiness is. And the ego, wrong-mindedness, brings you nothing. And, hap and everything and nothing, Jesus said, cannot coexist. The Holy Spirit and the ego cannot coexist. If you give your mind over to the Holy Spirit, you see there is no ego. There is no bad man, there's no boogeyman, there's no darkness, if you give your mind fully to the Holy Spirit, that's what that decision will do. It will save your mind, it will light your mind up. So that's what that really meant. I can feel it just skipping over that decision, have sex, don't have sex, surgery. It's like it's just lighter and then I just feel this movement up to San Francisco rather than it being yeah. a real... It's almost like you got a mission and it's yeah. an adventure, like, yeah, like okay Holy Spirit. <laughs> Let's, let's go up to San Francisco and let's shine the light. Let's shine the light. Yeah, it's so beautiful. You've got a purpose. There's a purpose for it. Thank God. <laughs> So we had these clips, <laughs> and, and I'm not going to let them go, because we just, you know, we're here, it's, we talk, 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 this Mexican election thing, it's like, that seems to be important, but, How do you do but this actually, uh, the, the question isn't who you vote for, but it's what purpose, what's in your state of mind. And uh, we do have, some of you know our friend Laura, Laura was was pondering about, okay, i got to do my duty and I've got to vote in the election and everything. And then Laura was at our retreat, we had it at Quantico, and then 
I got this message, you know, oh, we've got three scholarships available, and right away Laura came to mind. So she's at the quiet answer. She's, right? she's at the quiet answer she retreat, it. and she she made it, and yeah. she's not voting in Mexico because she's in oh, meditation. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but the thing is, that's what I mean about purpose. You know, it's like that today that guy that Andy's guru that told him, just be linked with God, man. Don't be worried about making money. This is the money guru. The Holy Spirit is speaking through the money guru this morning. You know, just be linked with God. Your purpose, what do you mean, to get to my level? What if your purpose with God is to get higher than my level, the guru says? <laughs> you know, isn't that great? It wasn't that, that was a great moment, Andy. That was a classic. But, so we've, we've seen the first clip. Now let's, some of you live in the United States and there's all this stuff about Supreme Court and you know what I feel about, uh, you know, less than 76 in the course. I am under no laws but God. Has anybody ever read that lesson? Everybody's so concerned about who, whether this guy's going to get appointed to the Supreme Court and there'll be more conservatives than liberals and we might, the women are all going, what if we lose abortion rights? We have a right to abortion. What if the law of the land changes and we can't have a legal abortion? Then there's minorities saying, what if they change affirmative action? And then there's people saying, LGBT, we just got same-sex marriage. We just got rights for gays and this and this and this and now this, this judge, what if the Supreme Court of the United States rules and turns the clock back and takes away women's rights, rights for blacks, rights for women to control their body, rights for affirmative action, all these things. You know, there's this big controversy. Maybe you can play the clip. Judges. 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 This is all about judges, external judges, external power. Some of, I mean, people are getting so caught up in this, but, you know, we're going to talk about, I am under no laws but God's. And that's what we're going to talk about on this show. But let's, let's play the clip here. It's a big controversy, ego controversy. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> that's great. So this is a good one to look at for the Course in Miracles students. You can hear the commentators say, these co Supreme Court decisions shape life. And for many people on the planet, they would say, you're exactly right. Whether a woman has right to an abortion or not, whether people have right to same-sex marriages or not, whether, whether people have civil rights, civil liberties, all of them are predicated on one belief that effects in the world, that things that happen in the world impact your experiences, impact your life. And yet, this is where A Course in Miracles, Jesus is doing one of these, look, Byron Katie, let's turn it around. No, your mind, your consciousness is making all the decision. Nothing affects you but your thoughts. If you have ego thoughts, you will feel the pain, the hurt, the fear, the shame of holding on to ego thoughts. Those are attack thoughts and those are all grievances. When you forgive, you experience love, light, joy, happiness, of, as you would imagine you would because they're in a line with God, they're in line with spirit, they're in line with truth. So the key thing here is that these Supreme Court decisions and political decisions, whether it's who gets elected in Mexico or whether there's more conservatives than liberals and everything, all of those are predicated on the belief that there's causation in the world, not in your mind, and that the effects can cause you harm. Whether it's past memories or whether it's what seems to be happening to you, and now it's all based on false cause and effect. So this is why I say that don't listen to A Course in Miracles teacher that says, well follow the Course, but when it comes down to political things, um, you've got to take a side and you've got to be against certain things and for certain things. Jesus never ever says that. He always says, come back to the Holy Spirit and be right-minded and forgive. And actually he wants you to see that all the images as the same. He doesn't want you to, to divide the world up as the ego does into the good guys, the bad guys, the, the heroes, the villains, the dictators and the tyrants and the 
oh, the blessed ones. You know, he doesn't ever encourage us to make that division. He's always bringing it back to the mind and saying, you have a decision in your mind to link with the Holy Spirit and see this differently. Above all else, I want to see this differently. I will step back and let him lead the way. You know, all the, the lessons are about tuning into the Holy Spirit and seeing the world differently before you wake up from this dream. And they're never about taking a stance or a side. So you see, there is no politics involved in the Holy Spirit's perception. You may be guided, there's nothing wrong with voting, and there's nothing wrong with doing anything in the world, going for surgery, taking a, a, an aspirin, there's nothing wrong with any of that. But the Holy Spirit is saying, yeah, I know you're afraid of the light, but please learn to join with me and join in the miracle more habitually, more consistently, so that you can perceive the world in a different way. And that's where the healing occurs, in that way. So this is good. This is just another issue, a very seemingly political issue that most people are, are really up in arms about now. They're like, now we've got to rally the army together and this must be stopped and it's hypocrisy and all this and this, when actually the deception is not in the yeah. senators, it's not in the Supreme Court candidate, and it's not even in the voters and the people. The deception is in seeing a world that's not even there, and then fragmenting that world into pieces, and then trying to attack and defend the pieces. That's, yeah. that's where the problem is. That's the sickness. It might even be a stepping stone idea, but I, I see that when the people are so afraid of these laws being overturned, and that it's really they're afraid they won't get what they need, and that they rely on the government or the laws. But Jesus, he bypasses all of those. If they really need something, even if it's a, a law or not a law, it, he finds a way to like... Yeah. Well, within the world's, ego's world, personalities do seem to be influenced by, by things that are external to them. But see, that's all part of false cause and effect. The Course teaches that the Holy Spirit looks not to effects, meaning he's not looking into all, any of the images of the world. He knows that they don't have a real cause, that the ego projected out all the images and the, the Holy Spirit knows that the ego isn't real. So of course the images aren't real. So it's to him, you know, the Holy Spirit doesn't see the world the way humans do. The Holy Spirit is like leaves blowing in the wind. Like he's like, woo, like flash dance, you know, like happy, happy, happy. It just, that's all the Holy Spirit sees is a bunch of leaves blowing in the wind. And then what's the big deal? Well, to the ego, everything's a big deal. Oh, you could take away my rights. I said this years ago, that I said there are no such things as human rights. Now this is getting really deep. I upset the Gandhi people and, you know, you get, you get too deep and everyone gets upset. But there are no human rights because why? There's no humans. You have a birthright. You are created by God. That's your birthright. You want a right? You were created by God as the Christ. That's your right. That's the only thing that you're entitled to, is the remembrance of your natural birthright as the Christ. And do you have any human rights? No. Do you have political rights? No. Do you have any rights as a person? No. No, you don't. Let's talk straight here. Come on. Let's, let's get into the Course. You, this Course will be believed entirely or not at all, so come on. I want the entirely crowd with me, because that's all there is. <laughs> there isn't. It's not like hand grenades and horseshoes. Well, it's close, you know, horseshoes. Well, it's close. The Holy Spirit doesn't play horseshoes. There is no close. You accept the atonement or you seem to not, which is really no option in my mind. So this is where it gets very uncompromising, but you have to start to realize whenever you get squabbling about personal rights and individual rights, and that's what a lot of this stuff is liberal, conservative, all these are constructs. There's no reality to any of this. You have to go deep enough before you get really truly happy. And unless you go deep enough, you're just going to still feel all these political thoughts in your mind. You're going to notice judgments and opinions and you're going to be taking a stand for this and against that. And that's just back to the world. That's just the ego. One of the things before the show we talked about going into, and maybe you have, but like Netta was talking about with the, the period being a, um, a decision to almost punish herself because of a belief that she caused whatever, some kind of sexual abuse in the past. Mm -hmm. 
And then I also, on my show, talked about projecting stupidity out there. And, and you said that they all meet in a place where it's attraction to guilt. And I don't know. I didn't see how that fit with my example. I see it more, at least intellectually, with Nettos. But I thought maybe we could go into that yeah. somehow as well. Yeah. Well, the ego made up its own god. The ego doesn't know God, so it made up its own God, and it's a, a very punishing, punitive God. And then why would someone punish themselves as a person? It's just, it's almost like mitigating punish, a greater punishment. So there has to be a deeper fear of God that's, that's underneath there. So it's almost like when a child does something and they think, oh my God, I've done something wrong, and they say, don't hit me, Mommy. Don't hit me, Daddy. I'll, I won't have any dessert tonight, Damn. or I'll lock myself in the room and I'll, I'll be grounded for a week. You know how kids give themselves their own mm -hmm. punishment. Why is that? To mitigate a fear, a greater punishment. Like I could be struck, or I could think they might not love me anymore, or something like this. But the ego invented punishment. God doesn't even know what punishment is, and the Holy Spirit doesn't even know what punishment is, because errors are to be corrected. They are not sins that need demand punishment. That's the core foundation of the ego belief system is that sins demand punishment. Sins are equated with guilt, they demand punishment, and there should be a fear associated with them. That's the whole ego system. Errors are to be corrected, and not only are to be, but the Course tells us have already been corrected. They've already been corrected. So whenever we get into this punishment idea, we just are saying, we're. I don't even believe that they've been corrected. Mm -hmm. And that's what I meant, the fear of the light. That's the fear of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the correction. He's the comforter, the corrector. And if there's a fear of hearing that voice and living according to that voice, then, then there's going to be all this other stuff comes in. Punishment. Anna talked about that on right. the show this morning, raised raise Catholic and, and fearing a punishing God. You better live a good life and do right. Because God will punish you if you don't. You know, it was the same version of the same, same thing. And this stupid, does that tie in at all? Do you see how that works? Yeah, I can see. Like, you were saying that when you came into this life, you, you it was like, I'm going to be smart. I'm going to have a, a well-developed intellect. And then you, on a previous show, you were talking about how that, you were starting to see that that was a defense. Yeah. That all this intellectual learning was a defense against the truth. And ever since you did see that, then you started to be more in touch with your feelings and you were, would rather let go of that than hold on to that as a defense mm -hmm. against God. So I think this thing where you were saying you just per, were perceiving stupid people, <laughs> that is under, that's a projection of your own fear of being stupid. Mm -hmm. Maybe from just a false association in the mind. And what's underneath that is you, you were saying, I'm, I'm not worthy, right. and that intelligence, that worldly learning will, is a compensation yeah. to overcome a feeling of, I'm, I'm not worthy enough, I'm not smart enough. And I'll get punished. Maybe. And I'll get punished because I'm not worthy enough. So it's like almost like propping the self up. Look at me, look at, look at how much I've learned. Don't hurt me, God. Mm -hmm. I've become an, an intellectual... <laughs> Being, please don't hurt me. That's that's what's going on at a very deep level mm. in the mind. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> We're solving solving everything. Here. Well, we got another clip. Yeah. Because what if success was based on a country being a certain way? What if there were better countries than others? The Holy Spirit doesn't think like that, but there actually are people that may believe such a thing. We, we show this Michael Moore's Where to Invade Next a few weeks ago, and he has all these great things about these other countries. This isn't done in a comedic way, but this lady who, um, she was the daughter of an, an Appalachian. Uh, for those of you in America, you know, they live along this... Coal miner. Coal miner. She's the daughter of a coal miner in the Appalachia Mountains. And actually, funnily enough, I would say a lot of people think that they have less, at least I do, I'll just put out less intelligence <laughs> than other parts of the world. <laughs> I'm like going to get crucified on my own. <laughs> All your intelligence beliefs are going to get wiped today. <laughs> so we want to go beyond that. 
And this episode, <laughs> I think, is a little bit. She says, instead of just, you know, trying to get angry at the government, she basically is going to fly to Switzerland and find a solution to this poverty in her area instead of just getting angry. So this is a two-minute clip of her flying to Switzerland, Switzerland. To, because the United Nations has determined that they're the happiest country in the world. So... I had to put a plug in for the show, so that's why. <laughs> <laughs> Cleverly, <laughs> bottom up is in there, yeah. So it's again, you know, it's been the United Nations has said it's the happiest country in the world, and they base they go to the source to find out. There's this man, the president there, and he basically was saying innovation and egalitarianism. And egalitarianism so uh, democracy, equality. Egalitarianism is a reflection of a healed mind, but of course there's only one mind, so it, even equality is just still a reflection of oneness. When, when you have a healed mind, you forgive, you see, it's the quantum field, you see everything is unified, but that's a reflection. And democracy, you know, people like to compare it to fascism and, and socialism and all kinds of things, but again, it's very, very much of a construct, it's very political. It's, it's, people are arguing all the time which is the best form of government, but wait a minute, the Course is teaching us that there is no world outside of your mind and that Jesus is asking us to let the Holy Spirit govern our mind instead of projecting the ego out into these countries, politicians, laws. You see, it's the same dynamic of the ego trying to project an external cause and saying, well, if the president had done this better or the Congress had voted this way and then there's all the liberal views and the conservatives and the moderates, all of that is a projection of error, is a projection of the ego. There's no reality. There is no politics in the Holy Spirit. That's why people get dissatisfied with politics because it's their own failure to forgive or to release the ego in the mind, gets then projected out and then blame the president, blame the politicians, blame the, this party or that party. You know, you see it's all part of a, an egoic blame game which really is projecting out this idea that something outside of you is governing you as an individual. But you aren't an individual, you are a mind and you have a very powerful mind and you can be empowered to think with the Holy Spirit. That's when I, I hear the word innovation. I feel you're willing to be empowered with something that the Holy Spirit will guide you to yes. creatively or we're, we're like that, you know, what now? Yeah. What would you yeah. have us do now? I would replace innovation with guidance, you know. If you want to, to have, be happy, it's actually guidance. And I would replace egalitarianism with the idea that I want to see all my brothers and sisters perfectly equal, that we are perfectly equals, no one is ahead, no one is behind, no one is more powerful, no one is less powerful, we are all the same in, in mind and we're all the same in spirit, but we, we don't uh, emphasize differences, we emphasize our unity, our connectedness, you know, that's, mm. that's the only way to look at the world and be happy. Okay, and our last clip uh, I have not seen, um, but I don't know, Andy's listening. Andy. Did you want to set, has he already set it up for everybody? Mm -hmm. Nicholas, do you know this, the clip you were going to show on Andy's show? I so. And I think I we've him, got yeah. Daryl Strawberry and uh, Chris, Chris Tucker. Tucker. And this is an interview about um, does money actually make you happy? Because the purpose video. Purpose video. These are very successful. Daryl Strawberry, I think, was in the World Series, baseball player, four years in the World Series, and everyone knows Chris Tucker, comedian, the from Chan Rush Hour. That's the Jackie Chan, yeah, Rush Hour. Wow, <laughs> that's great. 
Okay, well, our shows seem to go the full hour and a half. I, I'm willing from half an hour to an hour and a half, but it looks like the Spirit's, Jesus' plan is this. So thank you, David. Yeah, thank for, you for having me. Yeah. It was precious. Thank you, everybody.